In the spirit of introductions, just a tiny bit about myself. So that's Alexei Nozdrum Plotnitsky, but you can call me Alexei. Um, I realize I can now just say that I have over a decade's experience uh, working in, uh, which sounds like a lot, uh, working in applied mathematics and data science. Um, I've worked throughout like the entire process of doing uh, applied math and data science. So I have experience in problem definition. I have experience in analysis, modeling, simulation, generally cooking up solutions. Uh, and I have experience in implementation, be that like presenting uh, findings to a client or uh, implementing software, you know, working software to integrate with uh, uh, other systems. Um, machine learning ate my career recently, just like I think it's eating the world. Uh, just this week, I met somebody. Oh, I uh, just did a, a master's degree in forestry. Oh, and what did you study? Oh, I studied birds. Did you use machine learning? Yes. <laughs> so, like, everybody's doing machine learning no matter what they're doing at this point. Um, I've been a machine learning engineer. I've been a product manager. I've been a management consultant. Uh, and I'm currently available for the right project. Um, and then I took this snip, snapshot when I was putting the slide together. So this is from my Kaggle profile. Uh, and so this is meant to, to give you evidence that I know something about Kaggle and that you should listen to me when I talk about it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my recent ML experience has been in computer vision, and most of those medals, maybe all of them, are in computer vision competitions. And so that's what we'll be doing today. Um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, absolutely, this is a computer vision competition, and the only solution to computer vision competitions is convolutional neural networks train you know in the deep learning context um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna explain convolutions we're not gonna go down to that level of detail I think we should be able to have like an, an interesting discussion like about problem solving in this space and about ways to solve this problem without going there uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes there are definitely uh, like near the end uh, I'll, I'll be sort of breezing somewhat quickly over some uh, choices that winning solutions made, and uh, with like without explaining them in any way. But uh, I think we have an audience here where, uh, if someone's interested to ask questions about a particular topic, uh, we can go into a discussion about that. Um, like uh, obviously, I have a, a presentation here with slides, but like I'd like to be interrupted with questions. I'd like this to be a conversation as much as possible. Um, I may punt on your questions. I've definitely given presentations here before where every question was basically answered two slides later, and I guess that just means I organized my slides wrong. But we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, here, a uh, cheap visual, so this is from the Kaggle website. So this is the Understanding Clouds from Satellite Images competition. Uh, it's put on by this Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. Uh, quick numbers here, okay, that nine days is no longer true. It's 10 days ago, so this is very recent. This is, you're gonna see the state of the art in terms of Kaggle solutions to problems like this because this is very current. Uh, 1,500 teams is a pretty good showing. Uh, $10,000 prize money is very little, but uh, to be honest, uh, if you join a Kaggle competition hoping to win prize money, you're probably a fool because the odds of that are pretty low. Even if you're one of the best Kaggle competitors, uh, there are way easier ways to make $10,000 than to win a competition like this. Um, uh, agenda, this is basically what I'm hoping to do. So I'm hoping to tell you about the motivation, like why we care about this topic, and what the opportunity is in order to do something. I'm going to sort of state what the problem is. Uh, we're going to talk about the data generation process. Uh, often that's very black box in Kaggle, but because this data set was uh, prepared and a paper was published on how they did it, we actually can get some insights into to how they collected that data. And, and I think that also helps us talk about solving real problems in the real world. Um, I'm going to share some exploratory data analysis so we can understand what this stuff looks like. Uh, I'll talk about the existing state-of-the-art Kaggle consensus on how to solve problems like this. Uh, we'll look at the top four solutions, and assuming we have time, we'll also ask the question, why did Alexi do so badly in this competition? Uh, okay, so and this is going to be really wordy, but uh, so here's a couple paragraphs from the two papers related to this data set. Uh, I think it's interesting to hear the motivation put in their words. 
Uh, so, uh, and from the first, uh, so this interest in the mesoscale organization of shallow cumulus is piqued by the contrast between the frequency with which such patterning is seen in the satellite imagery and the extent to which it is neglected in studies of clouds and climate. This applies to process studies with large eddy simulations as well as general circulation models, be it in traditional or super parameterizations, whatever that stuff means. No, the translation here is, if you look at satellite images, these types of clouds are obvious, and yet they're not well understood and they're not well reflected in some of the modeling uh, and simulation that's done in the meteorological and climate science space. Uh, then similarly, we have this interest in the mesoscale organization of clouds focused on the downstream North Atlantic trades. Uh, we chose a region windward of Barbados, that's just east of the Caribbean, during the months of boreal winter. The region and season were of interest because they are characterized by regimes of small clouds associated with big questions like what sets Earth's equilibrium climate sensitivity and how sensitive are clouds to aerosol perturbations. Uh, uh, it is for these re same reasons that the region has become a focal point for long-term ground-based observations through the Barbados Cloud Observatory, as well as more el elaborate past and planned field studies windward of this observatory. Uh, the emphasis on mesoscale, and I guess what they mean by that are uh, meso-beta, which is, I guess, clouds on the 20 to 200 kilometer scale, uh, and to a lesser extent, this meso-alpha scale, meso -alpha scale, which is 200 to 2,000. Uh, it's because these patterns of organization on these scales are not a part of the discourse on these big questions. So these clouds are an interesting topic to these people. Uh, if we had data on them, if we understood them, uh, we might understand more about the Earth's climate. So that's the topic. What's the opportunity? So if you and I went to uh, worldview, uh, you know, dot earthdata.nasa.gov, whatever, we went to the Worldview website right now, we have access to twice daily satellite imagery with decent uh, resolution of the entire Earth. Um, there is a pair of satellites put into orbit around 2000 by NASA. They're named Terra and Aqua, which are cute names for sure. Um, they, uh, they traverse the Earth in such a way. So uh, right, I'm going to draw with this, and you can maybe see it. So this is the path. Uh, that a satellite took. Um, at some, around midday, the satellite crosses the equator, and so this means that they're able to get uh, daylight uh, imagery of the surface, and uh, these black bars are caused by essentially uh, the fact that the satellite doesn't actually, it doesn't actually cover the entire Earth every day. You can see it's merely, nearly everything. Uh, and so uh, the clouds, I mean, even looking at this right now, you can see a lot of character to the clouds, and so we should be able to study them. Uh, and so that was, that was the opportunity that they wanted to seize. Um, but okay, what, are they, what the hell are these measles scale clouds? Well, let, let's talk about them. So this is from the papers. I have some references in various places so people can track down where I got this stuff. Uh, so uh, this is they, the uh, authors of a paper that led to the creation of this data set and this competition, uh, they actually came up with their colloquial names uh, for these cloud patterns. So this is sugar, uh, you know, dusting or fine scale clouds. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's easier to see once we, we contrast them. So if, for example, we look at flowers, I think this cloud pattern is very obvious. I mean, it looks kind of like a garden of little flowers. Um, I don't think I even need to read the description uh, for this one. Uh, fish is another type of cloud. I actually found this one very mysterious until I read this description. And essentially what they're saying is they kind of look a little bit like fish skeletons or fish bones because they don't really look more like fish. Uh, and they've got sort of, they, they talk about uh, well-defined well cloud-free areas like uh, bounding them. Uh, and, and then finally we have gravel. So gravel is like a bit like sugar, but I guess they're kind of clumpier. Um, uh, oh, something I was going to mention uh, that I didn't is there's a little green dot in each of these little images here, here, and here. That's actually Barbados. So it's in the same place in every image. So that's interesting, right? We get different snapshots and where clearly different sort of types of clouds are dominating in this region. Um, and then here, uh, all at once, side by side, uh, these are, so these are the four classes of cloud that are interest, of interest in this competition. Uh, sugar, flour, fish, and gravel. Um, 
And of course, sometimes none of the above. So we have sort of five possibilities when we're looking at an image. Uh, and ultimately, the goal of the system is to achieve this. Uh, so you know, we have like a new uh, satellite image of, of a region of the Earth, and we're able to say like which parts of this image are where you know does sugar do sugar clouds sort of dominate the pattern? Where are flower? Where are fish? That sort of thing. And and in uh, this competition is very much about like a single tile, a single image that looks like this. Uh, but if we had a system that could do that, we could do something like this. So this is also from the paper. We could take our model and we could apply it to an entire day's worth of images from the Earth. And we could find out everywhere uh, what type of clouds are where. Uh, or like the other, another type of analysis we could do is we could create heat maps. So for example, they created these for 2017. And they were able to show like the regions where uh, you see a lot of sugar, flour, and so on. You can get interesting contrasts here where like this year, and it actually varies by year rather than just by season, which is I think, probably very interesting. Um, you know, we get a lot of the sugar and flour, and then sort of very few of these fish. And we can see immediately where in the world they are. Uh, right, you know, right here off of uh, Barbados, uh, for example, you actually get more gravel than you do kind of in the rest of the world. Uh, so it's perhaps a special region. Uh, right, so uh, we have this opportunity to use satellite data. We have these clouds that would be interesting to study. Uh, we're going to do computer vision. We're going to do machine learning. That's the only way to do computer vision these days. Uh, so we need to collect a data set. And so I'm going to talk about the data generation process that they went through in order to prepare this. So uh, they gathered about 10,000 images from NASA Worldview, uh, those images were roughly sort of 21 degrees by 14 degrees in terms of the Earth that they cover. But of course, the Earth is round and images are flat, so there's some complexity there, but it's not that important. Um, the time period they covered was about a decade, from 2007 to 2017. Um, they, uh, so they, to, to obtain more images and sample, or a, sample a greater diversity of clouds, we subsequently, also, added images from two further regions in the Pacific, uh, which were chosen based on their climatological similarity to the original study region upwind of Barbados. And so ultimately what they chose were, uh, they had a couple, a few, couple different seasons in a couple locations. So we had this boreal winter, which I guess is labeled DJF. I have no idea what that means. If anyone does, I'd be interested to hear it. Uh, east of Barbados, there's also this MAM season that they chose for the same region. Um, they picked a place in the Pacific, kind of roughly between Hawaii and the Philippines. Uh, and then they took that boreal winter data. And then boreal winter in some season denoted SON, uh, again in the middle of the Pacific between Mexico and New Zealand. Uh, and so here's like roughly where those are. Um, I think like one thing that's interesting they provided on this chart as well is the rough seasonal breakdown. So uh, we can see, like, like a, a sort of maybe if you if you squint and you don't look very closely, uh, these pie charts all look the same. But if you actually study them in more detail, for example, uh, here in the West Pacific, uh, there's perhaps only eight percent flower, whereas uh, here in the East Pacific, there's actually 27 or 33. So there's some very fairly significant regional regional variation, uh, and uh, by season. All right, so I'm going to stop here and I'm just going to inject a little bit of criticism into this process because I think it's worth talking about. So I'd like, I wanted to ask, like, what are we really doing here, right? So are we studying the clouds off of Barbados? Uh, because if we are, then I think this cho choice back here, well, I won't, I won't show the slide, but this choice of, of you know, adding in some extra images from other regions that are kind of like kind of the same as Barbados, I think is, a, is, a kind of, is, a, is an interesting choice. Um, I think if the goal is explicitly to be able to study those, that region east of Barbados, then we should be structuring our, uh, our study. If we're writing a paper, we should be stru stru structuring our cross-validation regime uh, if we're machine learning engineers, and we should be structuring our competition in such a way that reflects that, right? So for example, um, we're not interested in testing our performance on data from the Pacific if the real goal is to perform well east of Bar Barbados. So like if we were preparing a test set, we would only include images from Barbados. And the reason we sourced those images from the Pacific was to make the model in Barbados better. 
right? So if that was the goal, then that's how we should do things, which was not how they did things. Um, maybe the goal is to study the clouds globally. I mean, I showed you those interesting images a moment ago. If we had a model that could do this, we could you know, run it over the whole globe, we could aggregate data by year, and wouldn't that be interesting? But then sort of narrowing this data to only three regions is a very strange choice. For example, like a model, this model will underperform on the globe if it's only been trained on data from these special regions. I mean, we've even gone and chosen regions that are like Barbados. We've kind of like um, emphasized our sample bias by, by choosing to sample from similar regions. Um, and we sure can't trust our, uh, our cross-validation scores, our model performance, uh, if you know, it, it, it does great on this data that was carefully selected from certain regions, but we know for sure it's not going to perform as well uh, on the rest of the world, and we in fact don't know how well it will perform. Uh, so like, that's a concern. Uh, ultimately, though, I mean, I think the goal here was academic research. They, I mean, the, the authors of the paper that collected this data set were interested in the question, like, can they effectively crowdsource this kind of information and achieve something? And so they were really demonstrating that methodology. Um, so uh, to a, yes, go ahead. Sorry, hi. As a non-data scientist, um, recognizing that there's certain kinds of clouds, you know, on like the cloud dictionary, and like pretty much if I see that cloud here, or I see it in like Europe or Africa or wherever, like it's the same kind of cloud. So I just wanted to to challenge a bit more about like the methodology that you're calling into question versus the fact that like we kind of already have a common understanding of different sorts of clouds. Right. So uh, I guess some of this will get to the unknowable. But I mean, I would suggest that if, if these certain types of clouds uh, are more prevalent in some regions of the world than others, then there's some at least to a, a, a climate layperson, uh, something spooky going on there. And, and actually, quite possibly, these clouds do look different in different places. Um, uh, a more sort of mathematical argument that I'm more comfortable making will be that your basic prevalence uh, is going to be misestimated by your model. So I mean, if these regions are dominated by, well, actually, these cloud patterns at all, Right? We actually know that these regions unusually exhibit these cloud patterns. Then a model trained on that data is going to behave as if that is a frequent occurrence. And so we're going to have a lot of false positives when we apply it to the Arctic or something like that. And that could be managed. I think that type of sort of model bias, this kind of prior that it gets from prevalence in the data, I think can be handled fairly easily. Uh, it's the other aspects that I, I think uh, aren't known. Uh, I'd imagine the backgrounds would matter as well to some extent, because um, well, if you're if you're only sampling from like a few specific regions, for like you know if you're if water is probably well even even water looks different in certain areas. I'd imagine, um, so I'd imagine uh, having only images over water it wouldn't work very well in areas over land if that was of interest at all. Yeah, so this is almost there. exclusively over water, yeah. and, and you're right. Yeah, uh, and certainly when they when they threw this together. I mean, they, they ran it on everything, right? Uh, it was really bugging me, those uh, acronyms. D oh, we'll leave that one oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. DJF. Oh, did also. you look it up? Yeah. I finally figured it out. These are so esoteric that you know, it, was, it was very difficult to find. So these are uh, labels for seasons. Yeah. Uh, DJF is winter. It stands for December, January, February. <laughs> 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 I'll let okay, you guess okay. what the other ones are. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Cool. We got it. Uh, that's um, yeah, it's very biased to um, the parts of the world where they have seasons that fit nicely into those months. Well, I think mean, that's why they do it by months instead of yeah. giving the season. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, DJF in the Barbados. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, right. OK, so a bit more about the data generation process. So, um, so they had a bunch of labelers, and they drew bounding boxes, so boxes. And they drew them in areas you know, where they judged one of four cloud patterns to dominate. So it's not like that's the only cloud pattern there, but dominate. This is, these are their words. Um, like they could draw as many boxes as they want on one image. 
uh, and they could maybe draw none, that was allowed, uh, that they had to draw a box that was at least 10% of the size of the image, so no tiny boxes here. Um, uh, they like randomly sampled images to show uh, to labelers, but they never were shown to more than four. Uh, no image went to the same labeler twice, so they didn't do any of that kind of consistency check like you might do sometimes. Um, each image saw at least three labelers, uh, on, or so rather saw image three labelers on average. They had 67 participants. Um, like most of them were researchers, but they had some quote non-scientists in there. I assume by that they mean basically people like me who they showed those slides to at the start and then expected me to, to be able to identify these cloud types. Um, uh, they had, so had 10,000 images, but they were roughly seen each three times, so they collected 30,000 labels. Uh, and ultimately, about they figured 250 hours of, of they say, concentrated human labor. I think they did it in about a day. Uh, and by the way, like if you want to think about these things, like at $50 an hour, we're talking like 12,500 bucks. So that's that's the kind of eh, $50 seems like a reasonable amount. Um, and and so like I think. The, this bounding box choice uh, is, is very interesting uh, and worth discussing. Um, so, uh, so here I have uh, a, couple, like a couple of examples of two options. Uh, if you were going to label cars, for example, you could just draw these boxes around the cars, or you could kind of quite carefully draw these more complex polygons where you, know, you add extra line segments and you move these uh, intersections around. Um, ultimately, it was the judgment of the authors that they could create more value more quickly with these kind of bad bounding boxes. I mean, when you, when you draw a box, like a huge amount of the area inside that box is not actually the thing that you're labeling. And so in a sense, it's, it's noisy, it's oversensitive. Uh, I've got that, that image as an example here. That box around the sugar cloud is not very satisfying, but it's really fast to create. Uh, and so that was a choice that they made. Uh, if you're doing these computer vision projects like from scratch, the labeling approach and label tooling is critical. I mean, because you can make your humans uh, an order of magnitude sort of more effective if you make the right choices here. Uh, and so that's the choice that they made. Um, data quality, so I would summarize it to say not great. So this is from their paper. Um, on the left, we have a chart for interhuman agreement. Okay, so the metric goes, uh, we pick a human and we take a box that they drew. What percentage of the time did another human also draw a box in the same place? Okay, and so you can say like a roughly 50% of the time, like another human, like the other human also drew a box. This is for like all possible pairs basically. That's how they did this analysis. And it's worse than that because the definition of a box in the same place is IOU of 0 0.1, which is pretty low. Uh, hand waving looks like maybe 20% overlap, maybe. So that's sure not all the same pixels. Uh, and so lots of disagreement here. I mean, they were, they were drawing boxes around things that weren't box shaped, and they included non-experts. But they got something done, and they got it done quickly. So it's still interesting. Uh, the other metric here we have is this uh, pixel accuracy. Um, there's a couple of colored bars in there we can ignore. The, the authors of the paper for the data set did their own kind of fast AI ML thing. Uh, on it, so they kind of include that in this chart. But these are the humans, and so this is again like um, we take uh, the pixels that one human labeled and we compare it to the pixels of another and look for their percentage agreement. And so anywhere from 10 to 30, or 12 or so to 30. So the worst human, only 12% of all the pixels they labeled were actually labeled by another human. Uh, and so I guess it's interesting on reflecting that like when you look at these images and somebody shows you what flowers look like, you're like, oh yeah, sure, I got it. Right? But clearly not everyone agrees all the time. This is a bit ambiguous. But that doesn't mean we can't do uh, something productive with the data. I mean, they would claim in their paper that, uh, that their models were able to perform like, as well as their best human, essentially. Uh, and now, you, of course, now you have a machine that you can use infinitely everywhere that's as good as your best human. So that's, that's very encouraging. Um, Finally, we arrive at the data for the competition. So uh, they took the, the ground truth, which was multiple bounding boxes for multiple labelers, and they took their union. And so on the left here, I have these boxes, and on the right, I have this final mask. So a mask is like if your image is 
like height by width. In this case, they were 2100 by 1400. Then I have a 2100 by 1400 grid. And in every cell in that grid, I'm told whether or not this is like a flower cloud or a gravel cloud or whatever. So, hey, criticism. I have some more criticism to introduce here. So this makes me sad, for sure. Like, the original data, the bounding box data, was actually, frankly, very interesting. We knew who labeled this box. We could find out if they were a scientist or not. Uh, we could know what region of the world this image was taken, something that they stripped from the data when they provided it. Um, we could know when this image was taken, like what season. Again, they took that information from us. We could know which satellite, although I don't think that's very important. We could still know it. Um, it was compressed. Bounding boxes are like four coordinates. They take up no bytes whatsoever. But when you turn them into masks, then you have to compress them in some way. And Kaggle has these run length encodings, which are really annoying. Um, and I think it would have allowed for a more nuanced analysis. For example, we could have tried the intersection of the labelers. What did everyone agree on? Rather than the union, which we know actually they mostly don't agree on, because that's what the, the, the uh, quality metrics tell us. We could have con considered partial overlaps or even votes. We could have traded, treated our humans like an ensemble uh, and had them vote uh, on, on what they thought were valid pixels or not. And suddenly, the competition data is kind of much more bland. Uh, I also have a criticism of this union like, for one, I mean, so you're telling me that three or four humans labeled this image, and only one of them labeled this pixel as a flower, and you're telling me now that the ground truth for this pixel is flower? Like, I think not, actually. I think it's, it, we should probably consider it not to be flower. And then there's also this just base source of noise you create with this. Like, it, these images saw between two and four different labelers. So images that saw more labelers, like, by definition, will have a bigger mask because, like, you only have a possibility for the mask to grow as you add labelers. Uh, and so that's just going to be, like, a, a source of noise. I think this is very frustrating. Um, yes, uh, microphone. Maybe. No. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, with this uh, union of data, would that mean that some regions of uh, pictures would have multiple labels? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you're very quick on that, but yes. So the consequence of that is that like, while conceptually this problem is uh, a single label mutually exclusive problem, where like a cloud should only be of one type, in practice, the data actually frequently, uh, a single part of the image will have more than one label. And that is, well, we don't get to see the test set, but that is presumably true. And I think the fact that the competition winners did well, I think will demonstrate that that was also true there. So yeah, that's, uh, that is, that is, I have a slide about that, but yeah, that essentially puts us into a, a, a multi-label regime, although, I mean, uh, so, so every competitor who did very well like treated this where it was possible to assign multiple labels to a pixel, and they, they will have trained their models in that way. I think that probably fails to leverage something. Because like I said, conceptually, that shouldn't be true. And so there's signal, right? There's signal in the fact that it probably shouldn't have two labels. I mean, we need to allow it to have two labels because like we want to score well, and the test label, the test data set has pixels with two labels. But we should probably be suppressing that outcome in some way. And I didn't see anybody doing that. Um, uh, okay, so the problem, uh, I like this graphic. It introduces so sort of how we like to box problems in computer vision, or at least some problems. So in the top left, we have kind of basic like classification and localization. So we're basically saying. This photo, it contains many things, but this photo is about sheep, right? And this is roughly where the sheep are. Um, we could do object detection where we're going to maybe draw one of those bounding boxes around each of the sheep. Uh, so now that I'm detecting that there are distinct objects in the scene, uh, I could do uh, semantic segmentation where I'm just labeling the parts of the scene that are road and grass and sheep. Or I could go one step further and I could do this instant segmentation, which is the hardest problem of them all. Uh, and so, uh, the, like, the problem we're dealing with here is what we're calling semantic segmentation. So we have a scene, and we need to essentially label every single pixel as either nothing or the four classes of cloud. 
Uh, and the metric that we're going to use, which, I mean, if you've come to these, you've probably seen this metric before. So this is this dice coefficient. I should probably say the mean dice coefficient, because what you do is you compute this for every image and every class, and then you just take the average of it. Um, if you have one image and you want to compute this value, I have a little graphic here. So uh, if the ground truth mask is this gray circle, so that's what you should have said, uh, and if your predicted mask is the red area, the red circle, what you said, um, then we can compute it. We can think of it in a couple of different ways. Um, up here in the top right is this uh, intersection over union way of thinking about it. So we take the, uh, well, not quite union. That's what makes it different from IOU. So we take their intersection, which in this case is that gray E red E area. Um, uh, we take two times that, and we divide that by the total area of x over by the total area of y. This creates a number that's between 0 and 1. Uh, when, like, as those two circles become perfectly overlapping, then it approaches 1. And when they don't touch at all, it's 0. Um, if, you, if you break those regions down, so if we think about their intersection as this is, these are the true positive pixels. These are the pixels that you got, that you said were this type of cloud and actually were. And then those, those pure gray pixels are the false negatives. You should have said them, but you didn't. And then the pure red are the false positives. You shouldn't have, but you did. Then, then the equation breaks down as follows with this 2TP over 2TP plus FP plus FN, which is, by the way, the F1 score. So that's interesting. There's a, a strong parallel there. And then this really important fact. So like, if, if the ground truth mask is empty, there's, there are zero pixels. You shouldn't say any clouds of any type, or you shouldn't say any of this type, and you predict none, then both of these equations become 0 over 0. And what do we do about that? Well, we just define it to be 1. So if, the, if the, you shouldn't have said anything and you say nothing, then, then you score a 1. And this is, like, really important. This is massively important. Like, a simple example as to why... If the ground truth is zero pixels and you predict zero pixels, congratulations, you scored a one. It's the highest possible score. If the ground truth is zero and you predict one pixel, you score a zero. You get a worst possible score. That one single pixel changed, like, it made the, the largest possible impact on your average score. And so because of that, um, you sh probably should think about this problem as essentially a two-step problem. And in practice, that's how uh, people solve it. One problem is a sort of a classification problem. Like, does this image contain any clouds? Because that one decision essentially can switch your score between one and zero. So it's worth like, a huge amount of points. And then after that, once you've actually decided there is something here, then attempting to localize it. Uh, and so it, by dividing the problem up, it allows you to uh, apply focus in both areas, because both areas are important, especially the classification. Uh, there are situations where I think this is really valid. So uh, I think two weeks ago we actually covered this competition. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for that. This was the pneumothorax segmentation competition. So this is like a problem that people have in their lungs. Uh, it's also like it, it happens in a certain region. Uh, there in the top right are my results in this competition. So, you, sh you know, I know what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, and, and I mean, in this case, like I think placing a huge amount of emphasis on the classification task I think is valid. Because, for example, if I know this patient has pneumothorax, like I can send them to an expert to look at the x-ray and localize it. So localization is a nice outcome of, of you know, doing machine learning, but it's not maybe where all the value comes from. And so we can have this, this dice metric allows us to have a kind of a, almost a combination metric. We can ask simultaneously how well are they at, how good are they at classification and localization. Uh, do I think that's the case with clouds? I mean, I think I would need more domain expertise to really address that. But I mean, if we go back to this picture, it's getting to be a few slides back now, like this, I mean, how important is it that in any one piece of this, we got it right whether there was none or zero? Like, actually, I don't think that's very important. If our goal is something like this, like, we would actually be interested in calculating maybe that dice coefficient for the entire globe, right? And then it's never going to be empty, so we never have the zero problem. And so now the question is just how good are we at finding clouds? But instead, because the competition is based on single images, essentially it's a patched base, 
approach to the problem, then like, I, I actually don't think that's a good choice. Um, it's, it's hard to make a different choice, but I think that, that, that sort of discontinuity at the zero, I think is particularly unfortunate. Um, and then also, okay, wait. So you're telling me that we chose to take the union of all of the labels, which, as we discussed earlier, contains a whole bunch of pixels that a, a bunch of humans didn't think were cloud. <laughs> like, they don't believe that this is flower, but we've decided that it is. So in principle, that data contains a lot of false positives. And then we've picked a metric that severely penalizes predicting false positives. And I, I think that seems like a, a, a collision of ideas. Uh, maybe it's actually brilliant, and that's how you make up for your false positives. Uh, if that's true, I'm open to being convinced. Uh, but otherwise, I think that is a very strange choice. But. OK, uh, so what, what does this data look like? I have some uh, exploratory data analysis, AKA figures that I copied from a couple of kernels, uh, and I have uh, cited them appropriately. So first of all, uh, here's what some of the more complex images look like. Uh, they deliberately selected ones that had more than one cloud type in them. Uh, uh, you can see that black swath. That's the same one that we saw earlier when we were looking at the website. It was caused by areas that are not seen by the satellite. Um, and also, this is where I was originally going to point out that you can see that uh, these boxes very much overlap. And uh, when I first saw these visualizations, I assumed that meant that there was some kind of hierarchy where, for example, here, if a sugar pixel appears in the same place as a fish, then we pick sugar. But no, actually, that, that pixel is simultaneously fish and sugar. It was just in this visualization, uh, they only show one. Uh, other interesting facts, so in the, this is in the, in the training data. There were around 5,500 images. Um, uh, the most common number of different types of clouds in an image was two, but that was kind of about half of them. Uh, none of the images contained no cloud types, so they all had at least something. Uh, and if we look at the prevalence, pretty even, definitely not any crazy class imbalance here. Also, interestingly, I think those class prevalences, they look flatter to me than those uh, pie charts did on the globe. And so there's something going on there, maybe. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. you were just discussing that um, you would be uh, penalized uh, if you predicted there are, there are clouds, but there are no clouds, but you just showed the picture where it's zero, like actually there are no uh, pictures without clouds. I mean, uh, this is on a, a per cloud type basis. So in every image, uh, there is a ground truth for all four different types of clouds, and uh, you get a dice score for each type of cloud. And so um, uh, if you look at this, this chart here, uh, most of the time there is at least one type of cloud that's not present. And so in that case, uh, if, you, if you predicted any pixels for that type of cloud but it wasn't present, then you score a zero for that type. Uh, and the dice metric is an average across all types and all images. So it's cal calculated for each uh, type of cloud and then yeah. combined. OK. Yeah. And so, so for example, here, um, if you consider the, the intersect, so all, like all images times all cloud types. So you know, uh, four types and 5,500 images, so there are 22,000 possible combinations. About half of those are empty, and half of those are occupied. And so if you made a submission to this competition and you said no clouds anywhere ever, you would expect to score about 0.466. Because about 46% of the time, you're going to be right that there were no clouds and you're going to score a 1. And then 53% of the time, you're going to be wrong and you're going to score a 0. And so that should be what your score, uh, which is a pretty good starting point. And actually, given that the, like, the winning scores are around 6-7, that's actually not amazingly higher than 4-6, is it? I mean, it's, it's a lot higher, but it's not amazing. It's, less than halfway to 100, for example. Uh, and then here is a, a, just a correlation matrix on, on types of clouds that are present. Uh, and so we have like the four different types and whether or not they co-occur. Um, I, I think an, an, one interesting observation, I guess it's something we should expect, is that they're mostly negative. 
Because, of course, when we're labeling this data, the question is, which type dominates? And so it's unlikely that multiple types are dominating. So if we see one type, we're actually less likely to see another. Yes, Kenneth? So uh, maybe in this kind of uh, context where you said um, the discontinuity at point zero for the dice score, as you're saying about the dice score. Yeah. But the, so that means if you want to train this network, you, should, you shouldn't put any empty mask in it. You, you have to, like, split it out, is it? It's, it that's interesting. Uh, can I address that when I look at some of the top solutions? Okay. Because some people made some different choices, and I think we'll talk about it then. Yeah? Okay. Uh, press on the bottom. Yeah. Oh, so for the dice matrix, if the same region, yeah. Yeah, I just went back. But yeah. In the same region, for example, with two labor, so the dice matrix will can connect two time, right? Yeah, yeah, so it'd be possible. Can you move to the next line? You want us to yeah, look here? One. Yeah. For example, the yellow and the red, here. Yeah, yeah, this one. So the dice matrix we can unit two times. Yeah, so so um, I could predict I could predict these as red, and then when we're computing the dice metric for red, I would score positive points for doing that. I could also pick them for yellow, and when we compute the dice score for yellow, I also score uh, and then my score for this whole image is the average of the four different dice scores for the four different classes. Uh, and if I limited myself to only ever saying one class per pixel, then I will never get a perfect dice score because I will always be wrong somewhere. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so broadly negatively correlated, and in particular, I think this, this gravel and flower is strongly negatively correlated, which is kind of interesting. Uh, here's this little uh, plot of the size of these masks. So um, this is like in pixel count, uh, you know, so like a thousand by a thousand, which would be like roughly half the image, uh, well, 40% or so of the image is like about a million pixels, right? So some of these masks are very large. Some of these images are totally dominated by a cloud type, but some of them are also quite small, right? I mean, these are on the order of like 100,000 or something. So, uh, uh, you know, 300 by 300 kind of size, I guess. Yeah. So quite small. Uh, and uh, I'll try to remember to make a comment about that later when we look at solutions. Uh, and then there's no citation on these because I made them, uh, and I thought they were important. I threw them out into the Kaggle ether, and unfortunately, none of the, the bright uh, grandmaster types took them on because I absolutely think you could use these to improve your solution. So these are average like images. So uh, for the top left there, for fish, I took all of the ground truth labels across all of the training images, and I averaged them. And so, uh, so this is a heat map. Uh, one of the things you might notice, it has these cross patterns in them. Those are created by those black swaths. So like it's just, when it's black, they, they don't have a, a label for it. And so they've, that creates a little bit of noise there. But absolutely, there are regions of this image that are far more likely to be labeled by a human than other labels, especially the outside. Uh, yes, uh, microphone for Corey. Uh, Uh, so, is this specifically Barbados? Because does that also occur in the different areas that they also chose? Unfortunately, we don't know which image came from where. And so, this is actually an, an average across the three regions. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that there is even a trend to observe in that case. Yeah, especially the one here for flower, for flower right? Yeah. I mean, an entire eastern section of this image. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and so that must have been either very true for one region or somehow true for all of them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, quite um, and and something that one of the people commenters on my kernel said uh, was that um, when you create these visualizations with something like Matplotlib, the colors are usually normalized based on the range of the values. And so the question was, does this reflect just like tiny differences or significant differences? And so that's why I have in my second version of the kernel, I have these histograms at the bottom, and so we can actually see that like non-trivial amounts of pixels in these images are five times as likely to con contain these clouds than others. So that's pretty significant. And yet, indeed, for the flower image, the stuff on the right 
uh, dramatically more. And then we see the same pattern for the like gravel again, roughly even, but never at the edges. I mean, if you think about the, that data generation process, and I use those words carefully, by the way, when I labeled that section. Whenever you're doing uh, work in machine learning, you should, if you're designing the data generation process, you should really ask yourself, in what ways does this align to my real domain, my real target, and in, in which ways do, does it deviate? And then when you're trying to solve the problem as well, you should really ask about it. And so in this case, humans drawing boxes, they just don't mouse all the way over to the edge, right? Like when they're considering the image, they're asking, they look at the middle first. What clouds are dominating here? And, they, and so I think, I think that effect is very much there. The, the, the left, right, like sugar again here, dominates in the West. Uh, and uh, and that, that's presumably climate like a meteorological phenomenon, but the other is human for sure. Uh, Kenneth, I put you on pause and now I'll take a question. Yeah, so um, I forgot how you did this uh, heat map. So what's the process? I mean, um, you said you averaged some data. At, can you yeah, so I mean, conceptually, if you imagine um, like one of these masks is essentially like a height by width array uh, where every single cell is a one or a zero. Right? And so if you stack those up in a big stack, one for every training image, you could take the average across this dimension and get like an average of all those ones and zeros to find like just an overall probability for a pixel. Um, that uses up a lot of memory. And so like the more efficient way to do it is to just uh, go through your images one by one and add them up to a sum, a running total. And then that total will be like, 4,000 or something, and you divide that by the number of images, and you get you get a probability. So I think that should be 256, isn't it? Isn't like, um, is that not one byte in an image, RGP values, or like, uh, are you averaging across the channels, and then across all the images? No, no, this is not an average of images. This is an average of masks. So uh, like the, the ground truth masks, um, the humans labeled that say where a flower cloud is and isn't. Those are all ones and zeros. Where you're right, like uh, an interesting question would be to take all of the RGB images, the satellite images, rather than these masks, uh, and take that average. And um, I think that might be interesting. One of the phenomenons that nobody addressed, by the way, but is relevant here, uh, and I wish Payam were here because I know he works with satellite data and he works on clouds. If you get reflectance, like the sun reflecting off of clouds and more importantly reflecting off the ocean, and so you do get structured noise in these images, um, which you might want to address. Uh, and I think if you took an average image, that structured noise would come out at you because it's only ever reflected in certain regions and so that average will be systematically higher. Um, uh, uh, probably not for now, but at Rogue, if you want to ask me what the people should have done with this data to make their, comp their submissions better, go ahead. But it's a little too technical, I think, right now. Uh, interesting. Sorry, like the, my last slide is, the, I can see it on the screen still behind, but not up there, right? Anyways, uh, okay, so what is the Kaggle consensus on semantic segmentation? So I've told you the task. Uh, Kaggle has a habit of forming a consensus on how to solve a problem. Uh, it's partly because of the sharing nature of the community. That's like a positive spin on it. I think the community has a quick win cultural attitude, and so, uh, I mean, personally, like, when I participate in these competitions, like, I have limited time, and so I'm looking to, I mean, uh, get results as efficiently as possible. So we study what previous winners have done, and we tend to emulate them, or, or we look at very recent papers and attempt to implement them. So everyone's doing roughly the same thing. Uh, uh, I told you I wasn't gonna teach you the convolution. Uh, we can get into as much detail of this as we want, but I think just like at a, at a high level, um, we have these units, okay? Covered them to death at the Kaggle meetup. Um, what you need to know about them at a high level, their input is a height by width RGB image, okay? So like when you open an image on your computer, that's what you're looking at. Their output would be height by width by classes out. So instead of having three channels, R, G, and B, you know, in this case, you'd expect to have uh, and I told you that we treated this as multi-label. So, you know, you're going to have four numbers, each of them between zero and one, saying what probably do I think that, that we should label this uh, pixel from this class. Um, typically, 
they're built with these ImageNet classifier backbones. So this auxiliary task, I guess, is what we should call it in this case, where people have taken the classification problem for ImageNet. So it's a data set of about a million images with about a thousand different classes. People develop exotic architectures and train them to classify at around 85% top one accuracy. Uh, and then they repurpose those models and those weights. Uh, in this case, a backbone is essentially this gray stuff on the left. So we tra tr take what used to be like a classifier, we chop off the classification part right here, we bolt on this other stuff, and it already, like part of the model already knows like color blobs and edges and useful features like that, but it doesn't know anything about clouds. So we then connect this UNet stuff to it and we train that, okay? Uh, and the skip connections, are, their purpose is an ability to mix these high level features that are kind of, they have semantic meaning with like lower level features which help us get really good pixel masks. So the idea, you know, as you get deeper into a neural network, it has, uh, it has a, it, 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 it's ordered to form kind of higher order, more complex features. Uh, and so that's how you decide if this is a flower or not. Um, but uh, as you work your way through the network, the resolution of the image becomes worse and worse. And so you're not able to be very precise about where these clouds are. And so we mix these two things in order to get uh, uh, an accurate segmentation once we've decided that the cloud type is there. Now there's another type that's actually starting to show up in these competitions. These are feature pyramid networks. Um, this is a diagram of it, and we could talk about it. The implementations, I think, vary more than the UNET implementations do. I think there's not as much creativity in UNETs as there are in, in these FPNs. Um, like, but I made a point that the bullets on the right are very similar. And this is like, if you're new to this space, that's really what you need to know. And you don't need to understand what I talked about, high-level features and low-level features exactly. But the input is H by W, RGB. The output is H by W by number of classes. We use ImageNet classifiers as the backbone. In this case, for your information, that's this part here on the left. But again, we're pre-training on an auxiliary task and then repurposing that model. And this time, the pyramid is designed to allow us to mix these high-level and low-level features. But the motivation for that design is the same as the motivation for the skip connections in the UNet. Uh, and then the other thing we see in the Kaggle consensus is dice optimization. So as I said earlier, this dice metric is super sensitive to false positives. It's really important that you get that right or wrong so you can score the ones and not the zeros. Um, and an especially problematic thing is these small false positive masks. So like I said, ground truth zero, you pick one, sorry, worst possible score instead of best possible score. So if your model happens to output these little like islands of masks, you've got to look, those, look at those with a critical eye. Like, do I really think that there are any 100 pixel size masks in this data set? Or is it that every time my model predicts something that's 100 pixels, it's moving me from a 1 to a 0, and I should suppress those? So everybody has some form of post-processing in order to optimize for this metric. And they make different choices, and we'll look at them. Um, and I already talked about multi-label, because you notice that very quickly. Um, like, look it up. But it's relatively simple to switch uh, in most of these situations from a softmax categorical cross, categorical cross entropy solution to a sigmoid binary cross entropy solution. And now your target vectors are have more than one one in them. Uh, but it's pretty easy to implement. Yeah. Uh, this is a look at the leaderboard, by the way. So there were, I guess, 13 golds because there were a lot of participants. Uh, observations, lots of solo competitors in this. I mean, only one team. Um, pretty tight at the top, like not a lot of numbers separating those people. Uh, and yeah, these scores are less than halfway from uh, always saying no clouds to being perfect all the time. So, I mean, it's not like a linear metric. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's a little disappointing, but uh, then again, the data was very noisy, so the fact that we're accomplishing something at all, I think, should be, with $10,000 worth of data labeling, uh, I think is exciting. Uh, and finally, like, a little bit of shake up there, uh, but not right at the top, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'm, a, I'm especially proud of T-Bear down here, by the way. Only seven entries, so they were very disciplined, they didn't overfit, and they moved up 39 places. That's great. Uh, 
that's a professionalism right there. You can ask me what I mean by that later if you don't understand. Uh, right, so let's look at some of the top solutions. So I'm going to talk about the first place solution. This is only 10 days ago, but people are getting really fast at talking about what they did, and indeed sharing code. And I think this person has some code you can look at, although it tends to be hard to digest because what did I say about quick wins, right? Like making digestible code is not how you get quick wins. Uh, so this Pude uh, person came first. Um, it was a classic Kaggle ensemble, messy ensemble. So uh, basically, this person kind of iterated on their approach and design as they went. And I think they had lots of good models. And so they kept them around for the ensemble. So rather than kind of uh, like picking a final design and then training it multiple times and doing that, instead, it was more of this sort of mix of models that they, they built as they go. Um, their ensemble contains both units and feature pyramid networks. So those two things I, I mentioned earlier. Um, OK, so interesting things about this dice optimization. Uh, this is something I've seen elsewhere. This is something I've done. I think I did this in that pneumothorax competition. Um, uh, you can add a secondary task to your segmentation network. So it's, it's a little small here, but I have this diagram. So uh, these units, and to an extent, these uh, feature pyramid networks can be imagined as an encoder decoder architecture. Uh, and at some point in the middle, there's this most concentrated uh, feature vector, uh, which uh, represents the, the whole image. And, and if you, well, the image best as a whole. And if you global pool that and hang a linear classifier off that, you can give it a second task. So this model, when you train it, would have two losses. One would be the kind of normal loss where we're saying, hey, model, like predict this mask. Um, but the second one is also predict whether or not we should predict anything. And uh, uh, that gives you uh, this sort of raw probability that you can use to suppress those little predictions, right? Like if my segmentation said, oh, there's a little 100 pixel cloud in this image, but my, my classifier here said, look, there's no clouds in this image. Like, don't, don't listen to the noise, right? The, you know, there's noise in this, so you might get it. You can use that to make suppressions. And so that's something they did. They trained the model with this classification head. It's interesting, you might think that this secondary task might make the segmentation better because you're providing extra signal to your model during training. I think in practice, you don't see that. I don't know why, uh, but you don't. I don't. It doesn't make it worse, I don't think. Um, and so uh, an interesting choice they made, which Kenneth, you, you asked about earlier, and we'll also see in other solutions, uh, they also train some pure segmentation models only on true masks. So, uh, I, as you know, going back to Alexi's question, yes, every image has at least one type of cloud in it, but there's lots of them that are empty. And those totally empty, like, uh, uh, you know, one cloud type doesn't exist at all, provides kind of messy training signal. And so uh, you trained, trained a model that only saw those true masks. Now, if you use that model on all the images, then you get false positives, because this model believes that there's always at least some pixels. And so that would kill you on this dice metric, right? But if you combine that with the classification and use, you use that to suppress predictions from this model that had a better training signal, you might get better results. And given this person won, I think we can guess that they probably did get better results. We see this behavior from some others. Uh, microphone to Matt. Sorry, so we split the problem to like four problems, essentially, where it's like he's trying uh, to catch that. Yeah, so he, he tra trained a model on segmentation and classification, and then he trained a mo other model only on segmentation for, like, where it only ever saw the true masks. Okay. And so that's sort of like, I don't know how you want to count breaking downs, but yeah. Uh, and then also, um, to get better classification estimates. He took the top K, I think it was 1,500 maybe, but the top K pixel probabilities from the segmentation and took their average and used that as a classification prediction. Uh, but, but ultimately, it was this two-stage process of classify as being zero or not, and then using another model to, to do a segmentation. Uh, and I love this. I sprinkled some gold medals on there. Kaggle Hackery. I found this uh, emoji on Twitter. Mwah! It's beautiful. Okay? So we know that all of the data in the training set has got at least one cloud type in it. It's never zero. Okay? And so that's probably true in the test set as well. 
In real life, that's not true. In real life, sometimes there's no cloud types. But in, our, in this magical Kaggle world, that's true. And so what this person did is, if their model said no clouds of any type, they, they overrode that, and they picked the most likely cloud, and they changed that, and then they went with that instead. Uh, and the reason I think it's beautiful, like again, because this only happens in Kaggle, and I'm telling you, first place, right there. Like, for sure. I mean, look at this leaderboard. I mean, I can tell you second place did not do that. And, and they guaranteed he would not have come first without that move. And uh, if you nerd out on Kaggle enough, there's usually at least one of these little hacks in every competition. Uh, and like, it's not something you would ever do as a professional uh, in the industry. But if you're a professional Kaggler, you would do it. Uh, and, and it's just like, Kaggle's a puzzle. And it's a game. It's an eSport. Uh, and uh, I, that's not mine. I got that from someone. But uh, I, I appreciate a good competitor. And so I think that was and the only person who did that, I think. Uh, so quick little technical details about choices this person made, and we'll compare those to some of the others. Um, in terms of loss, uh, so their classification loss was binary cross entropy. Uh, that's you know, whether or not this image contains anything at all. Uh, and because this is multi-label, that should be uh, BCE and not CCE. Uh, in terms of segmentation, they did uh, a mix, a weighted mix of binary cross entropy and dice. Uh, we could talk about that uh, if we have time. I don't know how we're doing. Uh, okay, okay, then we won't talk about it. But there's a loss. Yeah, we, the, there's a loss function uh, uh, that people use that is kind of aligned with the dice metric, and but it doesn't work very well on its own. Uh, if you optimized it perfectly, you would get a great dice score. But if you only used it, you get useless gradients, and so people mix it here. Uh, in terms of atom optimizer, they used atom W. They used a weight decay. I guess if you're using atom W, you have to use weight decay because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Uh, they uh, they use a different learning rate for different parts of the network. This is something that we see uh, in uh, the Deep Lab, which is one of the sort of state of the art segmentation networks of things like Coco these days. Uh, they love this one cycle scheduler thing that the fast AI guys are promoting. Uh, in terms of backbones, they, they use a smattering of things. Uh, I think what I'll point out about this is something like a ResNet 34 is a pretty modest background, and a ResNet 101 is getting pretty large. So backbones, so they, and, and the other thing I'll say, uh, in terms of augmentations, they used a bunch of different augmentations. The one I'll highlight is grid distortion because it's very expensive to do. Uh, and so I think that was an interesting choice. Um, Second place did not use the Kaggle hack. They, again, it was an ensemble. They used only UNETs. Uh, in terms of dice optimization, they, they did this other thing, I, and maybe in short, to keep it, to keep it punchy. Um, they, they first picked one threshold, okay? And then they asked, which masks are large? Uh, and then they kept those, but then they actually backed the threshold off to something a little more permissive. Uh, and so they were able to get kind of larger uh, masks that way, but still suppress the false positives. Um, they put this funny downsampling module in front of their backbone and trained that at the same time as the rest. Uh, you don't see that very often, so I thought that was quite interesting. They trained with Atom. They trained with focal loss. Uh, they used uh, basically as the ResNex 50, because efficient net B1 is tiny. So that's actually a very reasonably sized model. And they use expensive augmentations. Um, Third place, use feature period net networks and UNETs. Uh, uh, I won't talk about their dice optimization. They, their losses were binary cross entropy and essentially this dice loss uh, that I introduced earlier. They had a bunch of different, sometimes very large backbones. Uh, the conclusion that I'm running to here is I just wanted to give a little summary. So like some of that stuff is like very fast technical detail for inside baseball. But um, things to know as like a relative probably newcomer to this, uh, you see all of UNETs, feature pyramid networks, and what I didn't mention, a true spatial pyramid pooling, or pooling pyramid, or whichever it is, networks. Uh, the point is that they all came in the top four. It doesn't matter which one you use. I mean, come on, basically. So, uh, uh, so don't fret over which one to pick. I would pick UNETs because they're easy to work with. Uh, Everyone has ensembles. It's the only way to win Kaggle competitions. Fine. Uh, everyone always does something for dice optimization. You can't not touch this if this is important to you. Um, we had all sorts of backbones, but I really wanted to point out that the second place and fourth place 
winners uh, had very modest sized backlogs. And so if you have a slow or small computer or GPU, like these things are achievable. You don't just have to, to have a mighty uh, hardware to win. Um, augmentation is very important to think about. Uh, optimizers, Atom, I, uh, you know, definitely if, if you're new to deep learning, I strongly encourage you to use Atom over something like SGD. It's very easy to use. Um, People like to say that SGD creates better Optima and blah, 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 and the uh, real alchemists use it, but top four all use Atom or Atom variants. One of these is the Atom, but anyways, uh, the point is uh, that it, it appears just fine to use. I mean, the winners are using it. And the other thing I want to point out is the fact that the losses are all over the place. So I showed you uh, binary cross entropy. We talked a little bit about this soft dice loss. Second place, I think, use focal loss. Uh, fourth place, was it? Or third? Third or fourth, use this exotic lavage hinge loss. You'll only ever see this in Kaggle. I think the reason is because it's, it's not that amazing, but people are cargo culting previous solutions. Uh, and so, so you see it. My point again, I don't think it matters because all of these were the top four solutions. Uh, and so I wouldn't fret over like lavage or, or however you're supposed to pronounce it, <laughs> frankly, uh, or focal loss. Like I would go with binary cross entropy, maybe with the mix of this dice. Uh, and I think I probably run out of time, maybe. So I shouldn't. How do you, how do we feel about this? A uh, couple minutes. Go for okay. Well, I, I won't talk. Wait, okay. We'll see. Um, for one, how would I have designed this project or this competition? Uh, so for one, I would have deliberately created a test set from the beginning. Like, I would have picked seven experts. I would have all labeled the same image. Uh, and I would have taken the ground truth to be a majority vote of those seven, which you would always get a majority because of that. Um, I would uh, construct a public leaderboard that had images from immediately the period after the training data. Because uh, I think time of year is an important signal. We will always know what time of year it is. So like, we should leverage that information when we're classifying clouds. It will make us better. Uh, but we don't want people to like, hack that data too hard in the competition. So we would hold data out on a time series basis. I would make the private leaderboard, like the true test set after that as well. Um, I would think about only putting images from Barbados in that test set if that was really our goal. Um, in the train set, I would have provided all that ground truth data. I would have given the comp competitors the opportunity to find which the garbage labelers are and just not use their labels. Like that person who's 12% accurate, do we really want to train our model on that? Probably we would score better on the test set if we could somehow exclude that information. Um, and I would, I would seriously consider the metric. Uh, like I don't think that false positives within a single patch are a massive problem. And so I don't think DICE is a good choice. Um, Pixel accuracy has its issues, but I don't think they would exist here. And so I would have been inclined to use that as a metric and possibly added a bunch of decimal places to the leaderboard if I had to do that. Um, very, very briefly, why did I do so poorly? Because I didn't try to win. Uh, I decided to play with bounding boxes. So I observed that the data here was actually humans drawing bounding boxes. And so that's why I thought, well, what if I got a model to draw bounding boxes and kind of recreated the data generation process with my model? Uh, and so this is an example of some masks. I wrote a little algorithm to like reverse engineer what the boxes were given the mask, so to try and recreate the lost data. Unfortunately, like that's error prone, but I think I managed to come up with something work pretty well. Uh, and then I pulled some uh, object detectors off the shelf. In particular, I used this MM detection library, which I think it's some Hong Kong university is the one that nurtures that project along. What I found, well, honestly, I already knew, but I'll emphasize for the audience here, Holy cow, complexity and hyperparameters. So this is like a configuration file for running basically my 1,000th place solution. Uh, and you have all kinds of choices to make. This is one, this is some more, this is some more. You have all of these hyperparameters related to things like, um, like what kind of resolutions you want to be processing the image at. Uh, how large you want the anchor boxes to be, which essentially the model resizes them based on what it sees. Uh, you have, the, you know, you have these region proposals and bounding box classifiers. And when you're training them, you don't just do like, uh, you know, compute the loss against 
between all of the right answers and all of the predictions because that doesn't work. So you have to do things like subsampling them or online hard example mining samplers. Otherwise, these things don't work. And, uh, and then finally, your model also tends to put out lots and lots and lots of bounding boxes. And so you usually need to reduce these down to like the best bounding boxes. And so you have these algorithms related to non-max suppression, where you essentially say, if there's one very likely bounding box here and one very unlikely one here, let's squash the unlikely one and only return this one. And so the hyperparameters are crazy. And so I think what, why I wanted to include this was Semantic segmentation is actually beautifully simple. Like it's very straightforward. Your model outputs a grid of probabilities and you have a grid of what it should be and you compute a loss against all of them and you run it. And so uh, if, the, if the goal really is semantic segmentation, probably shouldn't take on bounding boxes, even if they are objects that you could boxes around, which by the way, these weren't. <laughs> so it was, it was a bad choice generally, but I'm glad I got the experience that I did. Uh, and those are some references, and that's the end. I don't, I don't know where I want to leave it. We'll leave it there. Time for a question or two. Any uh, general questions? Uh, can we get a mic over to Corey here? Um, so this is maybe a bit of an out there question for you. Um, but if you had to, for example, there's a meteorologist that wants you to output this segmentation now, this bounding box or classification, and they want this on a daily basis, could you give me a very high level approach of how you would go about trying to implement a pipeline to get this kind of prediction to them, assuming that they there's basically just some data sitting around somewhere and you have to kind of build everything, but like high level. Right, uh, so um, we'll assume they have some kind of like yeah, live daily need, although probably in practice this is largely like uh, looking at historical data. Um, so at this point, um, like we, we have some good methods identified for achieving this. Uh, I would, like we would train a single model, none of these crazy ensembles, Right, um, we probably wouldn't worry too much about uh, the efficiency of the model. We could probably pick something very heavy because we don't ha we're not going to have resource constraints. Like we're not running on a phone or a satellite, right? We're probably running on a big fat computer sitting under a desk somewhere, or more likely in a cloud data center. Um, and so, uh, like the components are going to be, we need some kind of. Uh, uh, like a schedule and data pipeline that gets these satellite images as they're taken and brings them to the model that's deployed somewhere. We need some database where we're going to put the outputs. Uh, it's not going to be a traditional database because these are images, so we're going to be, uh, I, I don't know what that looks like. We may just be putting files somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, and then, yeah, we probably want some kind of model server that's got, uh, got um, like if we're doing this truly live, like that satellite actually like tracks across like, well, you can open the website, and I've done in the, when it's really smoky in British Columbia in the summer. I've actually been there refreshing the world view because I want to see what the smoke looks like in the valley. So you can actually wait for it. So you could get like hour by hour updates. Um, and so you need like some uh, probably probably on the cloud because that's cheap and easy. Um, like you want the model loaded into memory, you know, waiting for requests to arrive. Um, okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Good, high level. Yeah. I think we'll need to wrap it up here. Okay. There's lots of chance to talk about this some more at the Rogue. Uh, if uh, you're going to go to the Rogue, yeah, he's going to be there. So lots of chance uh, to talk there. Let's uh, thank our presenter once again for an excellent presentation. <laughs>